are turning in your Bibles this morning, we continue the Jesus Restore series, getting close to the end of the Gospel of John. And in this series, we are seeing the importance of restoration. We said restoration is renewal and revival and reestablishment. Maybe it's a reestablishment of friendship between those who are now enemies, or peace after a war that has happened, or a recovery like from sickness or from some other type of devastating consequence. We have said that Jesus will one day restore this world and he will make all things right, but he begins his restoration in the hearts of his people. As David said, he restores my soul. And then that restoration works out into our relationships, and into this world. Now last week as we began this series, finishing up John, we saw the epilogue of John 21. This is the conclusion, just like the book had the prologue in chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh, and He dwelled among us. So now John is tying up the loose ends of the book. He's giving us the final account that we need to understand the work of Jesus as the Word, as the Redeemer, and as the Restorer. So last week, we saw restored communion with the Sovereign Christ. And this week, we see restored commission from the risen Christ. Now, why is restored commission as important as restored communion? Well, what I have found as a pastor and as a Christian personally is that when I sin, when I fall, when I mess up, it seems the devil works on overtime. Our enemy seeks to make us believe we have forfeited our opportunities to serve God, that we have no more road in front of us to have a strong Christian life of service to Jesus And so we might as well throw an ultimate party of pity and just continue on sinning. Give up to smugness and complacency instead of the joy of getting back on the path God has called for us in his commission. So in earlier series through John, we saw in chapter 18 that Peter denied Jesus three different times. So the question is, how could he be capable of again serving Jesus Christ and making a difference in the lives of others in this world when he abandoned his calling to the Lord in Jesus' greatest moment of need during the trial on the Garden of Gethsemane? Forsaken his Lord, clearly and cowardly denied Jesus, even saying he never knew Christ. Jesus asked him in this passage, Three times a question that he's also asking you. Three times a question Peter has to answer, but we also have to answer in our commission. A triple denial will lead to a triple confession. And I would say to you, we as believers need restored commission just as much as Peter. We receive a commission every Sunday as we close out the service with a benediction being sent out into this world. And I pray today that we would restore that commission again in our hearts and our lives. So here with me, John 21, beginning at verse 15. So when they, the disciples, had eaten breakfast with Jesus, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, Do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to Peter again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. 
Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. It's very interesting as we pick up on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, when we see Peter being commissioned and called for the first time as a follower of Jesus in Luke chapter 5, it was right after Jesus had instructed the disciples to get a miraculous catch of fish that Jesus calls Peter to be his servant. And now in John 21, last week we saw a miraculous catching of fish. And now Jesus is again going to call and commission Peter to his work. It's also interesting to me in John chapter 18. The last time we saw a charcoal fire was at Peter denying the Lord Jesus Christ. And now at a charcoal fire, at the breakfast meal, Peter is again going to be restored and recovered from his failure and his denial of Jesus. So we pick up in verse 15. They had just eaten the breakfast that Jesus had prepared for them of the, the bread and the fish, reminding us of his earlier miracle in John 6 of the loaves and fishes. Matthew Henry mentions here that Jesus knew that what he was going to say to Peter was going to cause him some uneasiness. And so he didn't speak to him about it until after dinner because he didn't want to spoil his dinner. That's an interesting insight. Kind of a little extra human compassionate element of the Lord Jesus here. But what we notice is that all of a sudden, after the meal is over, Jesus signals Peter out. And we read here a hard conversation. Now, I want to say to each one of you that hard conversations are not necessarily bad conversations. In fact, it is critical to our growth as humans, and even more so as followers of Jesus, that we have these kind of hard, soul-searching, gut-wrenching, life-changing conversations on a somewhat regular basis. Husbands and wives need to have hard conversations. Parents and children need to have hard conversations. Church leaders and church members need to have hard conversations. And most importantly, every follower of Jesus needs to do this kind of soul inspection and renewing type conversation with their Lord on a regular basis. Sometimes the shepherd needs one-on-one -on -one time with the individual sheep. He doesn't always tend for all of the sheep together. He cares about each one by name. And that's what we see here. Many people have given in our modern world the idea of church discipline a bad rap. But you see, we have forgotten why God gave the church discipline, why Jesus spoke of it so clearly in the Gospel of Matthew. Church discipline is not to kick people out of the church. Church discipline is not to humiliate people. It is not to break people down and wreck them. The point is restoration and recommissioning, not expulsion. Yet we have really done a very pitiful job of this in the modern church in America. So this hard conversation begins. Now, Peter has every reason to fear at this moment he's about to be humiliated by Jesus Christ, to be removed from the role of disciples, to be expelled from the sacred college of Jesus' followers. But that is not what Jesus does to his children. And so today, I want to encourage you, if your face is down low, if you're hanging your head low in shame, if you feel like there is no hope for a future walk, there is no way God is going to use you in future days, that today you would especially pay close attention to this most important conversation. Now notice John the author in verse 15 is the one who calls him, the disciple, Simon Peter. Jesus does not call him Peter in this conversation. It is only 
the author, John, who says this. Look what Jesus says to him. Simon, son of Jonah. Or if you have the ESV, Simon, son of John. Notice he does not call him Cephas or Peter at this moment. I think there's a reason for that. He does not find Peter as Cephas right now. Now, what do I mean? The name Cephas or Peter is a name that means strength and stability. It literally speaks of a rock or a stone of some type. But before Jesus had given Peter this name, Cephas, Peter, he had his birth name. We read about that in the beginning of the Gospel of John, John 1, 42. Notice Andrew, Peter's brother, brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. In other words, when Jesus first found Peter, he was Simon. That was his name that he went by. This is, by the way, also the name Jesus used when Peter confessed him as the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, Matthew 16, Blessed are you, Simon Bar, or son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So clearly here, when Jesus is talking about Peter, the man, who is now getting this great revelation from God, he's Simon. He's Simon. When, when Jesus is doing something changing in his life, whether it's his calling or giving him the knowledge of who he is, he calls him Simon. And then later on in Peter's life, in Luke 22, when Jesus speaks to Peter and is warning him of his approaching fall, he says to him there also, Simon, Simon. This is in the upper room. This is before Peter betrays Jesus. Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. I point all this out just to say, I think there's a reason why. He doesn't call him Peter here. He doesn't call him Cephas here. He calls him by this name Simon. More on that as we continue together this morning. Now notice the question that is asked here, a very important question. Do you love me more than these? Do you read that in your Bible? Do you love me more than these? Now, if you listen to 10 different sermons and you read 10 different books on the Gospel of John, you might come up with about three or four different understandings of this question. And so I want to give you a couple of them and then tell you what I think this is referring to when he says, do you love me more than these? Who are the these? What is the these that he's speaking about here? Some people believe that this question is referring comparatively to the other disciples that are at this breakfast meal. Peter, do you love me more than you love your friends, the disciples? That's a good question. I don't think it's the question Jesus is asking, but it's a question we should all ask. Do we love Jesus more than we love our coworkers? Do we love Jesus more, here's a little harder one, than we love our spouses, than we love our children? Does Jesus have the supreme place of love in our hearts, in our minds, in our affections? That could be what he's speaking of here. There's a second idea that's been given that I particularly like as a pastor, but I don't think it's at all what Jesus is referring to. Peter, Simon, do you love me more than these fish, than this profession of being a fisherman. Why do I like that one? Because there's plenty of people that would prefer to have a Sunday fun day out fishing on the Sea of Pensacola than they would being with Jesus Christ and his church. So I, as a pastor, can say, yeah, okay, I like that idea. Don't think it's what Jesus is asking. But there are a lot of people that love to do their agenda, their thing. They love their work more than they love the God who gives them strength to do their work. They love success and money and status and things far more than they love the God who gives them the strength and the blessing of doing those things. So that is a problem, though I don't again think that's what Jesus is probably referring to. I think a third option is far more accurate. And that is, do you love me more than these other disciples love me? 
which might seem like a shocking question at first glance. Why would Jesus bring up other people when he's talking about Peter's love? We always say as Christians, first and foremost, our relationship is between us and God alone, not anybody else. It begins there, and then it works its way out, consequentially, from how much we love God. So why would Jesus be asking Peter, do you love me more than these other disciples love me? Well, I think God is beginning to do some heart surgery on Peter. I think that he is referring back to something Peter said literally just a few weeks earlier on the night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. In Matthew chapter 26, Peter said these words, though they all fail you, they all fall away because of you. I will never fall away, Jesus. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Now that sounds passionate. That sounds powerful. But there's a third P. I'm a preacher. Got to alliterate. That also sounds really prideful to me, doesn't it? Someone who's really full of themselves. Someone who really doesn't understand the power of sin and the power and danger of pride. I mean, it sounds good on paper. It looks terrible inside a heart. Though they all fall away, I will never fall away, Jesus. You see, the night of Jesus' betrayal and arrest, Jesus in John 13 gave his disciples that new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. And then Jesus warned his disciples in the upper room as they were eating that meal together, the Passover meal, and he gave them the Lord's Supper. He warned them. He said that you will not be able to follow me where I'm going. And Peter very boldly in John 13, 37 said, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And then later he says, though they all fall away, I will never fall away. See, there's a pride issue going on in Peter, big time, that night. And we all know pride goes before a what? For a fall, right? So the story continues, and they're walking to the Garden of Gethsemane on that fateful night. And I can imagine Peter is thinking in his heart, how dare Jesus say that I can't follow him? How dare Jesus say that Satan wants to sift me like wheat? How dare Jesus give such a prophecy? Jesus is wrong. How dare he think so poorly of me or speak that way of me in front of others, which is what leads him to say these words here. You see, Jesus here, I believe, is reminding Peter not only of his fall, but why he fell. Through overconfidence, through pride, thinking he was better than everyone else, by not watching, by not praying. Please hear me. A person who trusts their own heart and steadfastness instead of the Lord Jesus' heart and steadfastness is a prideful fool who is reap for failure. Hear that today. It is dangerous territory. So this question here that Jesus asks is a question that we should ask ourselves. Do you love me? Jesus is asking you today. Say your name right now in your heart. Jesus says to you, do you love me? I want to ask you, what is your present state of feeling towards the Lord Jesus Christ this morning of October 2021? Now, the word love here is important to point out. There's three different Greek words for love in the New Testament. If you've been a Christian a long time, you've heard preachers say this over and over, and most church members kind of roll their eyes, and they're like, got to hear this one again. So there is the Greek word eros, which is where we get the word erotic from. It's talking about a sexuality type of love, an intimate love. There is the second word, very famous in America, phileo. This is where the city of Philadelphia gets his name. It speaks of familial love, brotherly love. The city of brotherly love supposedly is Philadelphia. And then there is a third Greek word. It is the word that is used here by Jesus when he asked Peter this question the first two times. It is the word agape, or specifically here, agapeo. 
agape. This is the highest expression of love mentioned in the Bible. This is the word that G- Jesus uses and John quotes in John 3 where it says, God so agape, God so loved the world. This is what John uses in 1 John when he says God is agape. God is love. It, it is speaking of loving supremely, not loving by degree, but by loving the Lord your God with how much of your heart? All your heart. All your heart. So I say to you this morning, this is a question that when we're being commissioned, we need, if we want to be a part of God's work, we need to ask this question every day. I mean, really, this is a powerful question. There is a danger when the love of our hearts becomes cold. In fact, I want to say to you, we are deceiving ourselves If we don't have love for Jesus Christ in our hearts, Paul warns in 1 Corinthians 16, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be, and then it says the Greek word there, anathema, let him be accursed. So serious. If today your spiritual love tank is on empty when it comes to your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're under the judgment of God, he warns. In Ephesians chapter 6, there is a great benediction, a smile of God on all those who love him. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. So here's what I want to point out. The question is not, do you profess Jesus? The question is not, do you fear Jesus? The question is not simply, do you honor Jesus? Listen today, there are people in churches all over this world that know much about Jesus, that do much for Jesus, that give much to Jesus, that talk much about Jesus, that work much for Jesus, and yet are dead in their sins because they have no love for Jesus. It's a very solemn warning I just said. Knowledge of Jesus does not save you. Correct doctrine about Jesus does not save you. Outward works for Jesus do not make you a Christian. It all has to start somewhere, and that somewhere is in the heart with love for Jesus Christ. Peter had been repentant. He had wept bitterly when he had denied Jesus. He had returned to the fellowship of the church. For two Sundays in the last weeks, we saw Peter gather with the church in the room, and Jesus appears to them. We've seen Peter last week dive into the water of the Sea of Galilee. He's the first one that swims to Jesus, so excited to see his risen Lord. But this question is most important of all. Do you love me? Again, I say to you, he does not ask, are you elect of God? No election is vital. You can't be saved without being elect. He does not ask, are you born again, Peter? Though you cannot be saved without being born again. He does not ask, Peter, are you justified? Though you cannot be declared right with God without justification. He does not say, are you holy, Peter? Are you sanctified? Though I say to you, you can't be a Christian without having been made holy. All these things are important. All these things are true. But he gets to the very root of our faith. Love for Christ. The simplest test of a true Christian. Calvin has said here at this point, no man will steadily persevere in the discharge of our office. In other words, what God has called us to. No one's going to persevere in what God has called us to unless the love of Christ reigns in our hearts in such a manner that we are forgetful of ourselves and devoting ourselves entirely to Christ. And that's how we overcome every obstacle in this world. Look, I want you to know your calling and election. I want you to know justification. I want you to know holiness. I want you to have a great knowledge of God and love him with your mind. I want you to have hands and feet that serve God and love him with your strength. But it's got to start by loving him here. It's got to begin here. This is so beautiful. I remember as a young man in seminary class and hearing a really wonderful professor Close the class out each week in prayer with these beautiful prayers that were not high church sounding at all, but he always said, Lord, we love you. 
thank you for having us here today. Amen. And he would say those words, Lord, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. And as a newer Christian, those words were so shocking to me because I had sat in multiple churches. I had sat in Baptist churches. I had sat in Presbyterian churches. I had sat in charismatic churches. And I had never remembered anyone just simply saying when they prayed, simply, Lord, we love you. We love you. And I realized for a minute there that all the knowledge in the world means nothing if one has not love. I think that's in the Bible somewhere. 1 Corinthians 13. It changed my life. Now, Peter's answer is the most important answer. No matter who in God's family you ask, they will reply, yes, I love Jesus Christ. Whether it's the youngest children in this church who's a brand new believer, three years old, five years old, seven years old, a teenager who's just trusted in Jesus, 13 years old, 18 years old, whether it's the most seasoned believer We will always say in the affirmative, yes, I love you. Now, we may say, I don't love God as I ought to love him. But I will never say I don't love him at all if I'm a true Christian. Where there is true grace, there will always be true love towards Jesus. Now, notice Peter's response. He says, yes, Lord, you know. Now, what did did Jesus say? Peter, do you agape me more than these? But Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Yes, Lord, you know that I brotherly love you. Peter, by the way, answers with that word all three times. Why do you think that is? I think he now realizes his love is not better than James's love, not better than Andrew's love, not better than John's love, not better than Nathaniel's love not better than anyone else's love. Peter has been knocked off a pedestal and he has no desire to pridefully get back on it. He here knows who he is and he knows who God is at this moment. You see, when he says here, I phileo you, no more is he saying, though everyone else falls away because of you, I will never fall away. His sad denial has convinced him, as as Paul says, a wretched man that I am. I am a great sinner. Jesus, you are a far greater savior. I'm going to fall, Jesus. You're not going to fall. This is a humbled soul speaking here that we would have that kind of humility. And by the way, because of this, Jesus never brings up in the next two questions everyone else. No more does he ask, do you love me more than these, does he? In the next two questions. That was only the first time until Peter has gotten to that point of brokenness where God can begin to reform him and recommission him into the work he has called him to. So what does Jesus say to Peter here? Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. This is imperative. This is a command given to Peter This is the same word he also will use when he says, feed my lambs in verse 17. In verse 16, he uses a different word. This is agricultural. This is sheep language, right? As a shepherd provides for the needs of their flock, leads them to green pastures, leads them to pure living water to drink from. In the same way, he is saying to Peter, Peter, you have a job to do. And I want you to hear this today, church. He does not say, Peter, entertain my lambs. There's a lot of churches that are experts at entertainment. Nowhere in here. He doesn't say, Peter, be the court jester for my sheep. A lot of church is good at drama and comedy and putting on a show every single week. No, Peter, feed my lambs lambs. When I read this, I realize that Jesus will never, ever trust his lambs with anyone who does not love him. See that? You have to love Jesus before you get to be in the church community with his sheep and before you ever get to serve his sheep. 
When I read this here, I see the value of God's word and the importance for us to realize we are to care for others, minister to others, do good to others, seek out Jesus' sheep in this broken, wicked world, even the weakest and feeblest of them, even the lambs. Church Father Augustine says here, notice, he does not say thy lambs, he says my lambs. Jesus, just like Jesus said, I will build my church. In other words, it's not your church, friend. And by the way, brother deacon, brother elder, brother pastor, it's not your sheep. They are Jesus' sheep. They are not your property. They are not minister's property. They are not leader's property. They are God's property. Peter got this later on in 1 Peter. He says to the elders of the churches, shepherd the flock of God, which he purchased with his own blood, which tells us that Jesus is God and tells us that Jesus is the one who owns these sheep with his blood. Even to the weakest and feeblest of the flock, the weak believers, the little children in the church, care about them, shepherd them, Church family, do you talk to the kids of our church? Do you reach out to them? Do you speak to them? Do they even know your name? Do they even know you exist? Do you pray for them? Do you encourage their parents? Let me go a step further. Do you reach out to the spiritual lambs of our church? Meaning the new believers, the newly baptized, the new ones who have just come to this church. Are you too busy in your clique of sheep that you have forgotten the little lambs that God has blessed us with. Jesus doesn't forget them, neither should we. I love how the prophet Isaiah says in chapter 40, the Lord God will come with might and his arm rules for him and his roar is with him. Look at verse 11. You see this powerful God coming in Jesus Christ, but he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather those little lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead those that are with young. The point here is that Jesus does not give Peter the job to feed wolves, to feed goats, to entertain. He gives them the one job and one job only here, and that is to give the word of God and comfort and nourishment to the church of Jesus Christ. That's the one responsibility we read here in this first section. So important. This reminds me that the sheep are teachable. The sheep want to be fed. The sheep don't run away every time the Bible is preached. They don't doze off into spiritual la-la land every time the light of Christ is shined brightly from God's word. They don't prefer politics to Bible. Someone told me recently, I left my church for another church because I found a church where on the 4th of July, the preacher preached the truth about America and the Constitution of the United States. It's not the words of a sheep. The sheep want the word of God. They want to hear the voice of God. They don't prefer meddling sermons about trivial contemporary issues to the eternal issues of God. You see, friends, we need a word from God if we will be nourished. The Lord Jesus Christ knew that the success of the gospel in this world among men and women depended on the care which the ministry would be extended to them. We are not called as a church to make converts or to fill rooms. Nowhere in the Bible does it say pack out rooms on Sunday morning, though I surely want a full room. We are called to make disciples who are growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We have enough heads in sanctuaries, but not enough followers of Jesus Christ. We have enough fans, as one author has said, but not enough followers who are doing the work of Jesus, not giving him a bad name Monday through Friday, but instead are glorifying his name Monday through Friday. When he says, feed my lambs, this reminds us we all need a growing, healthy diet of truth. 
This reminds us that we need the Word of God and the sacrament of God. We need the Word of God and the communion of God. We need the Word of God and the church of God. We need the bread of life. We need the body of Christ, the Word of the living God. We need the blood of Christ. We need the fruit of the vine so we never thirst. We need living water. Jesus loves us so much. He has given us these gifts. And this first part of Peter's restored commission reminds us today of what we really need to be about his work. It begins with loving God supremely with our all. It follows by eating right. It follows by loving his lambs. So I want to stop here today because I got way too much prepared for the sermon. It would be like an hour and a half, I think, if I kept going. And I want to land the plane right here with you, brothers and sisters. I want to stop right here and just ask you a couple diagnostic questions as we close. Number one, number one, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? No one had to ask you yesterday if you loved college football. No one has to ask you if you love Sunday fun day and having the day off to go do your thing. But I ask you today, do you love Jesus Christ? I don't ask you, do you know about him? I don't ask you, did you come to church? Did you carry a Bible? I ask you, do you love him here with all your heart? Oh, if you don't, that you would say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. God, be merciful to me, a sinner that you would cry out to him. If you say, I love him, but not as I should, that this morning in prayer and repentance, you would come to the communion table praying, God, restore this commission in me. The second diagnostic question I ask you today is, are you feeding off his word? I don't want to ask you, do you have a verse a day to keep the devil away? Do you do your daily devotions and check a box off your list? Or do you attend church weekly? Again, I hope you do all those things, not to just check a box off the list, but I ask you, have you been fed by Jesus in his word? Are you being fed by Jesus in his word? I want to tell you something that I say a lot around here. I want to repeat myself, and that is that when you read the Bible, it's not to get a bunch of knowledge. It's not for information. It's for transformation. When I read the Bible, I don't try to understand everything I read. I try to get one sentence or one word that I hear the voice of the living God, and he transforms me. And it changes my day. It changes my week. It changes my month. It changes my life. And the last diagnostic question I ask you as we end today is, do you know a lamb? Some of you are lambs in here. You're new believers. You need some mature sheep around you to help you. But I want to ask you, have you invested in a lamb? There's lambs in this church. There's kids in this church. There's also spiritual lambs, new believers, newly baptized in the last year or two. Some people who are new Christians who are about to be baptized soon. Church is not a place where we gather, we walk in single file, we stare at the back of heads like a movie theater, and then we march out single file. We are a family that is supposed to care about one another. And it is absolutely impossible for church leaders to do this job alone. Do you have a lamb that you're investing in? If not, Jesus is calling you to be a part of feeding those lambs. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer.